family, saints and friends, and those of you on live stream. My name is Deacon Phillips. I'm really excited and delighted that I've been invited to bring you our Sunday School Overview. Today's lesson will be coming out of Ezekiel chapter 18, verses 1 through 9. And then we'll end in verses 30 through 32. The title is Take Responsibility. Ezekiel the prophet, main focus in chapter 18 is talking about individual responsibility before God. He told Ezekiel, speak on my behalf. I am a jealous God. I want them to glorify me. The Greek word for glorify is kebab, right. which means heavy. All right. God must be important in our lives. Yeah. And we are not to take him lightly. Come on now, come on now. Saints, since the beginning of creation, when God made Adam and Eve, we've always tried or attempted to pass the buck or blame on someone else. When God asked Adam, have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you not to eat? Adam said in Genesis chapter 3, verse 12, the woman whom you gave yeah. to be with me, yeah. she gave it to me and I ate it. Hmm. Adam was blaming Eve and God. Uh -huh. And so it is today. We continue with this mindset of blaming someone else. Come on now. We hear people say, the devil made me do it. Right. I do drugs because my mother and father did drugs. Come on. And even the popular saying, I do it because everyone else do it. Mm, what you say? Also, we hear. I'm a product of my upbringing. Uh -huh. But we as Christians know this is not always true. Yeah. Especially when you get Christ in your life. Saints, mankind inherited this type of sinful thinking from Adam. Uh -huh. His actions of eating from the tree of knowledge, known for good and evil, changed our nature and relationship with God That's it. because of his disobedience and rebellion. Uh -huh. He became the source of the human race sin into the world. Come on, come, come. Now the world embraces wrong being right and right being wrong. Mm, what you say? Sin, which means separation from God. Uh -huh affects our fellowship with God, uh -huh. not salvation. Yeah. Jesus paid for that at the cross. Uh -huh. Sin created a space between us and God, mm. which gets bigger the longer we stay in sin. What do you say? That space needs to be refilled by re a lifestyle of repentance. Uh -huh. Repentance is turning away from sin uh -huh. with the help of the Holy Spirit. We can't do it by ourselves alone. Because remember, we are now sinners when we are born by our nature through Adam. The biblical meaning of sin is any violation of God's divine standard. All right. So make sure you get this as we get into the lesson. Each of us, on our best day, <laughs> on our best day, mm -hmm. you are about? sinners mm -hmm. saved by grace. Yeah. God. Now, saints, because God is a generational God, which he refers to by saying, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, uh -huh, uh -huh. in whom he would bless. They were first, second, and third generations. Uh -huh. He was
was saying, he was not saying, we would be punished because of our great grandfathers, grandfathers, and fathers. Uh -huh. okay, you go. But during Ezekiel's time, this is what the people believed. Uh -huh. That they were being punished because of their fathers before them. Now, to an extent, we are somewhat responsible because we live in this society. Uh -huh. Also, we are, to some extent, re responsible for the church okay. because we are part of the body of Christ. Yeah, yeah. We're members of the church. Yeah. For example, when we know something is not right in God's eyes, uh -huh. we're supposed to stand up against it. A lot of times, we as Christians do not. Right. Uh -huh. So, saints, we have a responsibility to both the church, uh -huh. the body of Christ, uh -huh. and individually as believers in Christ. Yeah. Now, let's get to the lesson. Again, it's in Ezekiel chapter 18. We're going to start with verses 1 and 2. It says, Then the word of the Lord came to me, Ezekiel, saying, What do you, the people of Israel, my chosen people, mean when you use this proverb? A proverb means a saying. Uh -huh. Concerning the land of Israel. They were saying the fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. What you say? Yeah. This had to be a well-known saying mm -hmm. because Jeremiah quoted it in Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 29 through 30. Uh -huh. It meant we, the children of our parents, are suffering because of our parents' sins. Mm -hmm. Or another way to put it would be my daddy has eaten sour grapes. Now I got a toothache. They were making excuses instead of admitting they were sinners. Now keep in mind, in order to start repentance, which is the key to reversing sin, we must first acknowledge our sin. They didn't believe they were sinners. Remember, we're not sinners because we sin. Uh -huh. We're sinners because Adam sinned. Uh -huh. This affects every human being, which is why we must form an ongoing lifestyle Come on. of repentance. Come on. Let me say this. Listen. We can't keep doing the same sin uh -huh. over and over again uh -huh. and ask for repentance. It has to be a change in your heart to want to stop and turn the other way, circling 180 degrees, yes, sir. not 360, right. because you end up in the same direction. <laughs> These Jews in Ezekiel's time were probably referring to King Manasseh's mm -hmm. sins and them being the victims as told in 2 Chronicles chapter 33. Okay. Yep. He was an adulterer, an adulterer who turned against the true and living God right. and worshiped pagan gods. Uh -huh. Ezekiel warned them saying, you're going to stand before God, not for the king's sins, or your father's sins, nor Adam's sin. Uh -huh. But you're going to stand before God for our sins. Uh -huh. Saying God has always been for redemption. Yep. Being saving people from sin right. of all mankind. Yeah. Now let me be frank. I know. Yeah, That's my name. Okay, all right. <laughs> we as parents influence our kids with the priorities of our lives by what we feel is important 
And the Bible says in Exodus 20, 5 and 6, and I want to read that. And if you can, if you have a Bible or whatever at home, you can come with me to Exodus 20, verses 5 and 6. And it reads as follows. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Visiting the sin of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. In verse 6, it says, but showing mercy to thousands, meaning generations to those who love me and keep my commandments. Come on, friend, Hallelujah. <laughs> God is good. Uh -huh. In verse 3, this is an oath that God makes to himself. Uh -huh. He says, as I live, as I live. meaning I am the only true living God. Ooh, right. And this saying, I will not tolerate anymore. Because even though they were saying their fathers were causing it, they were indirectly blaming God also. What you say? And so you know, God said, "This is a no-no." Come on, God! How dare you? Never again will you say this. Uh -huh. So in verse four, Ezekiel says, "God says, behold." Listen clearly. All souls are mine. Uh -huh. Meaning every living soul belongs to him. Yeah. Proof positive. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The soul of the father as well as the soul of the son is mine. God was saying, I want each of you, each one of you, individually responsible and accountable to me. Mm -hmm. And I say to you, the soul who, sh who sins shall die. Uh -huh. God has no favorites. Right. And his normal plan for mankind was not death. Uh -huh. It was never meant to be. Man's sin is the cause of physical death. Right. In verses 5 through 9, Ezekiel presents three hypothetical cases, meaning, suppose he's talking to the Israelites. Uh, no, come on, come on, talk to the first one is, suppose a righteous man who does right. Verse 5 mentions, if, which means under these conditions, a man is just, again meaning right before God's eyes, right, right. and does what is lawful and right. This is a sign of a good man whose character traits may be coming from a godly family. All right, all right. God bless him. But we know this is not always the case. We love our parents to death. Yeah, yeah. But we can look back now on some of their faults. Come on. Plus know they did their best. Right. Which Come should on. be good enough. Uh -huh. Verse 6, Ezekiel says, Suppose okay. if he, the righteous man, has not eaten on the mountains. Mm -hmm. The mountains were high places scattered throughout Israel uh -huh. where adultery was being practiced and food was being set before idols. The idols were foreign images being worshiped by the people. In verse 6b it states, nor 
lift up your eyes to the idols. He's still talking about the righteous man mm -hmm. who does not worship idols All right. yeah. Yeah. of the house of Israel, nor defile his neighbor's wife committing adultery. Right. For approach or no approach a woman during her impurity. Right. Right. Time during her period time. Right. This was an issue of uncleanliness right. which comes out of Leviticus yeah. chapter 15 yeah. verses 19 through 33. Okay. It says if he has not oppressed anyone Treated somebody unfairly, but has restored to the debtor his pledge, yeah. paid back the money he owed, yeah. has robbed no one by violence, but has given his bread to the hungry, self explanatory, right. and covered the naked with clothing, self explanatory. Right. If he has not exacted usury, taken excessive interest mm -hmm. nor taking any increase which could have been money or taxes right. but have withdrawn his hand from sin or iniquity and executed true judgment meaning good judgment between man and man All right. if he has walked his lifestyle in my statute his laws, God laws and kept my judgments, his commandments, faithfully. He is just right before God's eyes. He shall surely live. That means living with God's reality in harmony with your life. Okay. He shall live, says the Lord God. But now here, Ezekiel. He gives another scenario starting in verse 10. He says, now suppose he, a righteous man, mm -hmm. have a violent son uh, my Lord. who sheds blood, but his father does none of these things. So saints, the Lord was arguing to the Israelites the son gains no advantage for having a godly father. Oh, right, right, right. There's no advantage. Oh. He still got to own up to his own sins. Yeah, help us today. He went on in verse, starting in verse 14, Ezekiel gives another scenario to the Israelites. He says, and I know some of this is extra, right. but I needed to go through it so that y'all can really understand it. He says, now suppose this son mm -hmm. has a son mm -hmm. who is righteous and the father is not. Mm -hmm. This son will not share in his father's disadvantages or sin. Right, right, right. The Israelites, as we move down to verse 19, God says, turn and live. That again means living with God's reality in harmony with your life. Uh -huh. In verse 21, God says, but if a wicked man turn, he's talking about repentance. Uh -huh. God is saying, turn from their wicked ways, which he was, has committed. Keep all my statutes and does what is lawful and right, he shall surely live. He shall not die. Because he was trying to make these scenarios or present them to the Israelites because they kept trying to say, We're, we are being sinned or punished because of our father's sins. And it, Ezekiel was trying to let them know no, that's not right. And then God comes in and tells them, no, that ain't right. I let it get by with Jeremiah. But I'm not going to let it get by no more. So, it goes on, if you all can follow me to verse 25. Okay. Come on. God confronts 
the Jews. Yes, sir. He says, you, the yet you, talking about the Israelites. The ways of the Lord, you say, the way of the Lord is not fair. Hear now, O house of Israel, is it not my way which is fair and your ways which are not fair? He goes down into verse 27 and he says, again, when a wicked man turns away from his wickedness, which he committed and does what is lawful and right, he, he presides himself. He saves himself from sin because he considered and turns away from all sin which will be committed, which he committed. He shall surely live. He shall not die. Saints, the Jews had a hard time with forgiveness. Uh -huh. They always were talking about they were the chosen. As we go on to verse 30, God it says, Therefore I judge you, Israel, O house of Israel, everyone according to his way, everybody according to what you do, says the Lord, repent and turn from all your sins, so that iniquity will not be ruined. All right. He's again telling them to repent. Uh-huh. And change. As we go on to verse 31, it says, Cast away from you all the transgressions which you have committed, and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Yeah, yeah. Stop being led by the flesh. Change your heart so I can give you some mercy and grace. Come on now. At the end, it goes on in 32. For I have no pleasure in death. It was never his intentions of us dying. We, as our, with our sins, caused that. Or should I say Adam? And it says here, says the Lord, in the end of 32, therefore turn and live. Again, meaning living with God's reality in harmony with your life. Uh -huh. The Jews never got it. Mm -hmm. Even when John the Baptist came on the scene, uh -huh. they were still talking about we're the children of Abraham. Yeah. John told them I could turn these rocks into the children of Abraham. That's right. So they never really got the point of get, wanting to give forgiveness. They always felt that they were the chosen ones and that we were the ones that had to do all of that. So, let me leave you with this in closing. Right. I hope you've learned more than you knew Come on. when we started today's lesson. Because if we're godly people, we need to take up the responsibility for our own actions. Okay. Uh -huh. Because none of us are all that God wants us to be. Amen. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Let's stop two-timing God uh -huh. and become influencers of God. Thank you. And let to God be the glory.
Christ. I can give the acknowledgement to you, my brothers and sisters in Christ who are here in the sanctuary and to those who are on live stream. I greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For this is the day that the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Amen. Why don't we give the Lord a hand out of praise this morning? But once again, he has watched over. He has kept us throughout the night and early this morning. He has touched us one more time. Started us on a brand new day. The day that we've never seen before. The day that we should never see again. Amen. Amen. Come on. Let's, let's give him praise to God. Be the glory.
heart say amen. amen. Why don't we give Sister Kawanza the music ministry around the cross to get us started out on fire. We'd like to give thanks and praises and respect to Brother Frank Phillips for the excellent job he did on our Sunday school lesson on this morning. We'd like to just thank everyone who is here and those who are watching live stream on how you are just allowing the Lord to use you. Oh, yeah. May we please bow our heads for a word of prayer. Most eternal Father who art in heaven, Lord, I thank you once again you, for allowing me to see an extra day. I thank you, Father God, for allowing me to wake up in my right mind. But not only did you wake me up, but you allowed me to sit up and stand up and get myself together and come back to the house of bread once again. Father God, this is something I do not take lightly, Father, because there were some people who didn't get up this morning, Father. But Lord, not only did you allow me to get up, but you allowed everyone who is in attendance and everyone who is watching to get up to grow stronger in you, Father. And Lord God, it's preaching time right now, Father. And Lord God, as I decrease, fill me with thine Holy Spirit to increase me, Father. Lord, don't let them see R. John Robinson, but let them see Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who was born in the manger, because there was no room for him in the end. Lord God, let them, Father God, hear Jesus, Father, and let them feel the presence of thy Holy Spirit in this building, or wherever they may be watching from live stream. Father, open up the avenues of my mind, my heart, and the word that I'm about to present to your people, Father. Lord, I thank you, and I love you. For it's in Jesus' mighty and strong name I pray. Amen and thank God. Amen. Giving all praises and adorations to my Heavenly Father. Giving all praise and adorations to my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Giving respect and honor to everyone who is in attendance in the house of the Lord right now and those who are watching on live stream. Truly it's a privilege and honor to stand before you once again to declare and present to you the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh, yeah. I'm not here for self-promotion. I'm just here to promote the word of God. I'm not concerned about any accolades. I'm not concerned about any pats on the back. I'm not even concerned about how well you say that I may preach this word. I'm just concerned about every individual having a relationship with Jesus Christ. Evangelism is the heartbeat of the church. Jesus told his disciples to go ye therefore and teach our nations. Yeah. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. Yeah. Sometimes we can get caught up what take place on the inside of the church and forget about what's happening on the outside. Wow. There's going to always be more on the outside than there are on the inside. Yeah. Man's greatest assignment is to go out and tell the lost about a man named Jesus who can save them apart and according to their yeah. sins. Yeah. But there is a word on today. On, Would you please open up your Bibles to the book of Romans chapter eight. The book of Romans chapter eight. I'll be commencing at verse 31 and I'll conclude at verse 35. Okay. The book of Romans chapter eight. I will be commencing at verse 31 and I will conclude at verse 35. And at this time, as we open up our Bible, let's put our hearts and our spirits and our minds and our soul on God and his spoken word. And when you have found it, please say amen. amen. Verse 31 reads as follows. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall say, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that he is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, 
or famine, or nakedness, or pearl, or sword. That's the end of the reading of the word of God. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. For God is good. God is alive and the spirit dwells in this place. Verse 31 reads again. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? For a topic on this morning, I'd like to talk to you about we're on the winning side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're on the winning side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My brothers and sisters, one of the things I've learned in team sports is that you do not play the game hoping that you would lose. You play the game with a mind to win. Regardless of what the score might be, you should have in your mind that you can win the game. Some people in the world feel that the body of Christ is on the losing end of the battle against sin. They observe that the church, in order to compete with the world, has to do the things of the world in order to lure unsaved people into the church. God equipped the church with the most powerful thing on earth, and that's the word of God. See, Jesus didn't depend on his miracles to get people saved, although it got their attention. He depended on his word. Peter and John didn't depend on bowling nights and movies. They depended upon the word of God. Paul didn't depend on hip-hop gospel to lure the Gentiles. He mainly preached Christ. Today, many churches have changed their approach on Sundays. The music that prepares our hearts to receive the word of God is a change for music that is marginal hip-hop. No matter what you're going through, you need to realize that you through Christ are on the winning side. It doesn't matter if you live on the south side. It doesn't matter if you live on the north side. It doesn't matter if you live on the west side or you live on the east side. Stay on God's side, which is the winning side. A lot of parents ask me during Ty's football games, they said, Mr. Robinson, why you don't never say anything or you show any emotional when your son is on the football field? And I explained to them, I said, what's already understood don't have to be discussed. I told the gentleman that, and he said, what do you mean by that? I said, I give both of my kids the three principles in life. I give them <clears throat> pretty much what I call the recipe for success. First of all, stay with God. Second, get good grades in school. And third, your recreational activities. But parents can easily get caught up in their child being a winner on the football field, on the basketball court, on the track and field team, on the dance team, on the volleyball team. All of that's fine. Just make sure they're on God's team first. So we all need to make sure we join God's team before we join any other team. We must be a member of the body of Christ before we start trying to be a member of anything else. You must be a member to be on the winning side. For Romans chapter 8 verses 1 and 2 will help us understand who's on the winning side. For verse 1 tells us there is therefore now no condemnation to them that which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. In other words, Paul is saying because of Christ's redemption, believers who walk in the spirit can be confident that God will not condemn them. Guilty or wrong. See, God will take our side against any and all adversaries. For verse 2 tells us, For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is the winning side. For the law of sin and death is the losing side. For those who haven't accepted Jesus as their Savior. Now all of us are born looking like our parents. But we believe looking like our destiny. <laughs> I think I'm gonna say that again. <laughs> All of us are born looking like our parents, but we leave looking like our destiny. Yeah. What are you saying, Reverend Robinson? What I'm saying is you will leave the world looking like the side you choose on earth. Yeah. <laughs> so in other words, if you choose God's side, you're gonna leave looking like a Christian. Yeah. If you choose Satan's side, you're gonna leave looking like a demonic evil yeah. being. But Paul wrote this letter to the Christian in Rome. 
during his third missionary journey while in Corinth. For the book of Romans is called the Romans Road to Righteousness because we started out as sinners. We needed salvation. We must be sanctified. We see God's sovereignty in saving Jews and Gentiles and we owe him our service. For the book of Romans, we see salvation from start to finish. For chapters 1, 2, and 3, we see the need of salvation. For chapters 4 and 5, we see the way of salvation. For chapters 6, 7, and 8, we see the life of salvation. For chapters 9, 10, and 11, we see the scope of salvation. In chapters 12, 13, and 14, we see the service of salvation. But in Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 35, the Apostle Paul asks seven questions. For the first question Paul asks in verse 31, 8, he says, what shall we then say to these things? Uh -huh. Paul wants all believers in Christ to see that we are secure in our relationship and our union with Jesus Christ. On, see, once we accepted Jesus as Savior, we were inducted into the universal family of believers. Right. Now, I don't know about you all, but I like watching the National Football Hall of Fame. And, and one of the things that stand out to me are uh, those gold jackets. And, and uh, uh, I, I always, you know, pay attention to the guys who have already been inducted into the Hall of Fame. If you notice, they have a line, a few men on one side, other men are on the other side, and those who have been inducted, they walk down the middle. And what they do, they high-five those who have already made it, and those who have already made it give them a hug. Sometimes, some of those men are crying. And that's a prestigious and an important moment. But what I'm trying to say is when someone is inducted into the body of Christ, the angels in heaven rejoice at the throne of the Lord. <laughs> Jesus said, Father, this is why I came and died for him. But the question right now I have for you all who are here and those who are watching live stream, what are the Christians saying about the winning side? <laughs> are they speaking up or are they remaining silent? There should be some celebrating about this side, y'all. There should be some shouting about this side, y'all. There should be some high-fiving about this side. There should be some tears shed when you join the winning side. Because this is the right side. But the Apostle Paul, y'all, he asked six more questions in verses 31, B, and 35. But I want to examine and give you five answers to Paul's six questions. So, I call these our five spiritual benefits for being on the winning side. Now, my job, uh, we have to enroll in our benefits from October to November. And if you, and if you don't enroll in your benefits by, the, by November 1st, you miss the deadline, and you cannot enroll in your benefits to get medical, dental, vision. You miss out on it. And so that's what we have to tell those who haven't accepted Jesus is it's open enrollment time. Yeah. And if you don't enroll into the body of Christ, and if you die and you don't have Jesus as your Savior, you have missed the deadline. So we got to tell people that there are some spiritual benefits when you join the winning side. So our first spiritual benefit is God is for us and not against us. Our second spiritual benefit is God is for us by giving us his son. Our third spiritual benefit is God is for us in spite of our failures. Our fourth spiritual benefit is God is for us because Jesus intercedes for us. Our fifth spiritual benefit is nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. For our first spiritual benefit in verse 31b, God is for us and not against us. For first 31, he says, if God be for us. Now, we're in Jackson. The word if is a conjunction. It's a conditioning conjunction. And each conjunction does something different. And we have several conjunctions. But this conjunction, if, follows you everywhere you go. This conjunction, if, follows you everywhere you go. Well, what are you saying, Rev? The word if in this verse doesn't mean that God's being for us is a possibility. It means it's a certainty. See, this isn't about the possibility of God's love for us. It's about the certainty of God's love for each of us. So you can raise your head up high with confidence knowing that God is for you. See, the word us 
is used 11 times in chapter 8. It refers to born again Christians. See, God loves everyone, but the born again believer gets special benefits that are not believe. See, a believer gets special benefits than a non believer. See, a non believer is not going on an island, but a believer, he or she is going to always be covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. See, we don't have to second guess whether or not God is for us. We have to know in our heart that God is for you. See, your family may have turned their backs on you, your boyfriend or girlfriend may have broken up with you, your job may have disappeared into the thin air of layoffs and cutbacks. Yeah. You, may even be, you, may, you may even feel unloved right now. Yeah. But I have some good news that the maker of the mountains is for you. The one who made the oceans is for you. Yeah. The one who created you and me, the animals, the stars, the planets, the galaxies, with the tops of his hand is for you. Yeah, See, God is for you. Not was, not will be, or might be, or could be, but is right now. Right now. His availability to you is not dependent on whether or not you have been good or bad. He's not some kind of Santa Claus checking his list twice and frowning at what you did last week. No, God is for you. Right now, and my brothers and sisters, the laws are still here. Our sin nature is still here. The flesh nature is still here. But Paul is saying to us, if God be for us, what difference does it make? <laughs> and there are some more good benefits, my brothers and sisters, for God being for us. He loves us. He protects us. He blesses us. He forgives us. He leads us. But Paul is saying that God is on our side. But sad but true, some Christians don't understand that. They act like they're in a game and God has decided that he's going to be on the other team. They feel like God is looking for ways to make them miserable. God is not against you. He's for you. He's on your side. He's on your team. Jesus is your friend. And when you have a friend like Jesus, you don't need to be afraid of anyone. So the question may be asked right now, Reverend Robinson, who can be against me? But I want to let you know right now, I want to drop in your spirit, my brothers and sisters, there are some people who would try to come at me. And Satan is the biggest one. Satan is against us, trying to defeat us and destroy us. But as long as you're in this world, there will be some people who don't like you. There will be some individuals who don't love you. There will be some individuals who are just not for you. There'll be some individuals who just don't want to see you make it in this thing we call life. But as Christians, we're sometimes told we're old-fashioned. <laughs> we're sometimes told we're out of touch. We're sometimes told we're weak, fake. We forgot where we come from. We're sellouts and we're boring. Now that comes from many times unbelievers because they're jealous of our peace and our joy. Even our sin nature is lined up against us trying to bring us back into our old selves. Yeah. But I want you to think about something right now. I want you to add up all your opponents on this side and weigh them against our all-powerful God on this side. Yeah. And you will see it's no match. Yeah. But Paul just shows us that God is for us and not against us. Yeah. Yeah. So our second benefit tells us that God is for us by giving us his son. Yeah. For verse 32 tells us, for God gave up his son for all of us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. For whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God did not spare his own son, but gave him up for all, all races of people. So there's nothing greater God could have done to prove to us that he's for us. Notice what Paul says about this. God has given us his son. God didn't hold back his son, and he will surely not hold back anything else. God didn't give us anybody else's son. He gave the whole world his only begotten son. The son that the prophets talked about. The son that John the Baptist talked about. The son that John the Baptist baptized in the Jordan River. Jesus Christ was not a man that God found and adopted to be his son on earth. He's the divine image of the Father. See, Jesus existed before he even took on human flesh. When God said in Genesis 1 and 26, let us make man in our image. After our likeness, he was talking to his own son and the Holy Ghost. Today, we're on the winning side because of God's own son. Not only did he give us his son, but God delivered him up for us all. His disciple Judas delivered him over. Pilate delivered him over. Herod, the Jews, delivered him over. We delivered him over. 
Jesus even delivered himself over. For the word delivered up, the scribes handed someone into custody of the authorities to be judged, to be punished, and to be put to death. But God gave us his son to be delivered to death. For Romans 4 and 25 tells us Jesus Christ was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. That God was delivering his son to death. And Jesus is the only one worthy to be delivered up. Now, what we got to understand is we, that we owe this all to Jesus because he paid the debt that we had owed. Yeah. Now, what we got to understand also is that Paul continues to bless us by saying that how he shall not with him also freely give us all things. Yeah. See, God gave us his son graciously. And in kindness, God gave us Jesus. See, God gives us to us out of grace. God helps us even when we don't deserve it. See, look at the word, all things, y'all, in this text. What a dynamic promise. See, he's not talking about material things. God is going to supply all of your needs. See, God isn't going to cater to our greed. He's going to supply all of our needs. See, God wants, you, wants to help us look more like his son. Every day God wakes you up. You should be striving to be more like his son. We should be thanking God for his son. We should be praising God for delivering his son up for all of us. We should be appreciative for God freely giving us all things we need. And I don't know about you all, but what a precious gift Jesus was to us because he has drawn power. He has given power. He has saving power. And he has all power in heaven and in earth. Now, when I had to take care of my mother and my two uncles, I started out taking care of my mother, and when I found out I had to start taking care of two of my uncles, I got in my car, and whenever I really want to talk to God, I get in my car, and for some odd reason, I always get on I-20. Right. Right. I-20 is, 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 is far. You know, uh, I-20 will take you, uh, a long, uh, you know, a long way. Come on, and I always had all the windows down in my car. And I always like to ride down I-20 at night. Because I really want to hear a word from the Lord. And I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, I'm taking care of my mother already, but how am I going to take care of my two uncles? I have a full-time job. I have two children. I have a wife. Yeah. I have ministry, preaching, teaching. How am I going to do this? The Holy Spirit spoke to me and, and, and told me, loud is true. You were made for this, son. Not only did I call you, but I equipped you for the job. And as I was thinking about this, all I could think about was Romans 8, verses 31 yeah. through 35. Uh -huh. See, losing a loved one can easily have you feeling like you're losing. Yeah. Low self-esteem will make you feel like you're a loser. A breakup in a relationship will make you feel like a loser. Yeah. Being laid off your job and not having enough money coming in can easily have you feeling like you're losing. Right. Not finishing school, dropping out of school can easily have you feeling like you're losing. Right. Raising your child or children the right way, then they turn around and be the opposite way can have you feel like you're losing. Right. Yeah. Seeing others being more blessed than you can easily have you feeling like a loser. Right. My brothers and sisters in the sanctuary, and y'all and, and are watching live stream, you're on the winning side yeah. because the gift we receive is a winner. Yeah. So the third benefit tells us that God is for us in spite of our faith. Now, my brothers and sisters, when we fail God, He is there to pick us up. Sometimes you are around smiles, uh -huh. friends pulling at you, peer pressure pulling at you. Uh -huh. But when we read a passage of scripture like Romans 8, Satan will try to remind us of our failures. Uh -huh. You find yourself saying, Is God really for me? Because I have done too much wrong. Yeah. I've made plenty of mistakes. I've made some poor decisions. It's hard to believe that God will still be for me. Despite our failures, God is still for you. In this world, there are two types of sinners. that are saved and unsaved. The difference between the two is a saved person has accepted Christ and the unsaved person hasn't. Both are still sinners. Because we were born sinners. But when we fail, God wants us to reach out to him. We must call on the name of Jesus because the prosecuting attorney is Satan. The accuser of the brother. Yeah. When we fail, we have a defender, a legal defender, a spiritual defender, a counsel for defense. Yeah. Satan tried to press charges on us when we fail, just 
like he did Job. He goes before the judge and says, you can't let them into heaven, Lord. Don't you know what a sinner he or she is? Don't you know the bad thoughts that was running through their mind? Did you hear those bad words come out of their mouth yesterday? Yeah. Look at the bad things he or she has done. Yeah. See, Satan knows what we're like. Yeah. But who can bring charges against the elect? Yeah. It doesn't matter what Satan says. It is God that justifies. Yeah. See, God freed us. He's the justifying God. He wants to justify sinners creating saints. He wants to bring man to the right state of relationship with him. See, once you've accepted Christ, God sees us differently now. See, God, God has declared you and I righteous. Just remember, Satan will try to bring charges. He's going to accuse us, but no charges will stick. He won't be on, it won't be on your record. See, too many people have a bad record in the district attorney's office. Some are on probation. Some are on parole. But I come out and tell you, as long as you're on God's side, then your record is squeaky clean with Jesus. But I'm not concerned with my record with man or how man views me. I care about my record with God and how he views me. Yeah. But in spite of our failures, God is for us. And the charges against the elect have been dropped. Right. See, you got to tell Satan the charges are dropped. Don't look back on your charges. That's thank, just thank God for dropping the charges. Yes, the charges are dismissed because the blood of Jesus yeah. have dismissed them. Yeah. So the fourth benefit tells us that God is for us because Jesus intercedes for yeah. us. So Paul is really saying that Jesus has our back no matter what. Yeah. But how many people have told you, I got your back, and then they came up short? Come on, they could barely watch their own back. But when he leaves us, he has our backs covered. See, there are people who try to condemn you. All they can do is try, but they won't succeed. Yeah. See, Satan is always around working with people. Satan has no right to judge us, and we should be judging other individuals. Because Satan knows he's already been judged. But Satan knows that God has put greatness in you. He doesn't want you to know that you have greatness in you. He doesn't want you to tap into your greatness. He knows when you tap into your greatness, you can rebuke him in the name of Jesus. Once people realize their purpose in life and God's plan for their life, Satan knows you a threat and kingdom building will begin. See, no one can condemn us because Jesus intercedes for us. Jesus did four things, y'all. He died. He rose from the grave, he sits at the right hand of God, and he makes intercessions for us. Yeah. His death was the condemnation of sin, and his resurrection was the announcement that sin had been dealt with fully. He sits at the right hand of God because no one else is worthy. No one else was perfect but him. He paid for our crimes. He pleaded our cases to the Father. He is our mediator, our middleman. Jesus is always in the middle. He's in the middle in the Trinity, and he was in the middle on Calvary. See, our best isn't good enough because God is absolutely holy. We can only measure up to Jesus Christ. Yeah. See, we don't have to go to a priest anymore. Thank God for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jesus is now our high priest working on our behalf in the very presence of God. Yeah. See, when we sin, there is Jesus in the presence of the Father and seeing for us. Yeah, yeah. Jesus has us covered. Nobody can cover us like Jesus. He has a lifetime insurance coverage on those who are under when inside. Jesus' death functions as our defense. He lives his life in us. Those who are on the winning side, his risen life is your life. We have what it takes to live the Christian life because of Christ. It's not us. It's Christ living in us and interceding for us. So before I take my seat, our fifth benefit is nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. See, we're on the winning side because Jesus is in us. He cheers for us. And he wants us to be the best that we can be. When we're, when, we're, when we're on the winning side, you can expect to have haters. The good news is the haters can't defeat you because God is for you. All they can do is be against you. Not even haters can separate us from the love of Christ. But Paul gives us a list of strugglings and struggles in a Christian's life. You do know Christians do struggle, right? Winners have struggles also. Because the apostle Paul suffered six of these things himself. For he first of all says tribulation. Tribulation of a strong person in life. And so I want to ask you right now, is there anything that's weighing you down? Yeah, yeah. Is there anything that has you, that keeps you from getting up to look up to Jesus? Yeah, yeah. Then he goes on to talk about distress. That means limited space. Have you come to a point in your life where you feel like you can't take it anymore? Uh -huh. You're just tired of it. You want to give up. 
you ought to throw in the towel. But I want to encourage you right now to hang in there, y'all. Because Jesus is still on the throne. Then he talks about persecution. Those who live godly lives will suffer. See, a lot of Christians don't want to suffer, and they don't want to make no sacrifices. Then he goes on to talk about famine. That's talking about hunger. But see, there may be some people who don't know where their next meal is coming from. Our job is to help those who are in need. Then Paul goes on to talk about nakedness, refers to a lack of clothes. You might not have everything you want, but Jesus is really all you need. As long as you got King Jesus, he will always make things better. Yeah. Then he goes on to talk about pearl. That's talking about danger. I don't know about you, but heaven is what I live for. Yeah. And heaven is what I'm willing to die for. There's danger all over us. And Jesus is our shield of protection. Yeah. Then he goes on to talk about this sword. That's talking about a Christian. Some Christians will be persecuted yeah. because of being Christians. But we must keep a winning attitude. We must keep a winning spirit. Whatever goes on in your life, keep reaching toward the prize. Yeah. There's going to be pressures. There's going to be circumstances. There's going to be changes. There's going to be changes that come in your life every single day. But Paul also says in verse 37 that despite what comes our way in life, that we are more than conquerors in him that loved us. He says he will carry out the victory. We are victorious through Christ. And because of Christ, the reason why we're winners. The reason why we're victorious is because of Calvary. See, what happened in Calvary declared us winners. See, someone used to shout it out, get it off your chest, and say, I'm a winner. I told our youth last week in children's church, I told them that you are winners. I said, every day you wake up, you need to say that you are a winner. I want to tell everybody right now in the sanctuary, those who are looking at live stream, you are a winner. Regardless of what's happening in your life, the way you may feel, if you got some bad news, I want you to know that you are still a winner. I want you to type it in the comment section, I am a winner. I want you to type it in the comment section and tell somebody else that they are a winner. See, I don't know about you, but the nails, the cross, and Calvary, and Jesus' blood declare all of us winners. In Jesus Christ, you always win. See, Satan used Judas to, to portray God. Satan used the scheme of Jesus' enemies to have him crucified. Jesus' crucifixion was the keys to God's winning plan to secure us eternal life. But I don't know about you all, but Satan loses and God wins. Yeah. Satan loses and you and I win. Yeah. But what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. What can make me whole again? Yeah. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. See, the party started on earth when it was hollering Hosanna, Hosanna to the highest, when he rolled into Jerusalem, Lord of them, on the donkey. Yeah. And the party ended in Calvary when the angel said, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. But I don't know about you all, y'all, but I'm declared a winner because of what Jesus did for me over 2,000 years ago. Somebody made me wonder, what did he do? Well, I'm going to tell you what he did. He wrapped himself in human flesh. Came down through 42 generations. What am I doing good? Healing the sick, raising up the dead. He even walked on water. Even allowed the lame to walk again. But I'm talking about Jesus, y'all. Mary's baby. Jesus, Joseph's son. Jesus, Elizabeth's nephew. Jesus. James half brother. Jesus, my bridge over troubled waters. Jesus, my brother when I'm motherless. Jesus, my father when I'm fatherless. Jesus, my friend when I'm friendly. They marched him to a hill called Calvary. When they got up to Calvary, they stretched the ride. They hung him high. He said, Father, forgive them when they know what they do. His last and seven word was, Father, if I hate I can be in my spirit. But that's not the end of the story, y'all. They took him down. They put him in the of Armadale's tomb. He was in the great Friday night. He was in the grave Saturday night. But something happened between Saturday night and early Sunday morning. He got up with all the power in his hand. He got up as a winner. He didn't get up as no loser. By him getting up as a winner, that can make me and you stand up as a winner. That can make me and you look at other people in the eyes as a winner. That can make us love the individuals as a winner. We're all the way inside. May the Lord bless you keep it my prayer.
my court shell or decal. And I set up all of my signs, all of my quizzes, all of my exams. And as I am setting them up, there is a little section that says do this. And once I enter a date in that computer, if a student tries to submit work to me after that due date, the computer won't accept it. But my babies have learned that they can cry out to Prom Jackson and say, hey, I'm sorry I missed the deadline. I had this situation come up in my life. And I can go back in there and I can change that due date and give them another chance to turn in their work. We wish all of life was like that. That whenever we miss an opportunity, we can get another chance. But my Bible tells me the day you hear my voice, Harden your heart. Because you see, God in his eternal plan has set a due date on each and every one of us. And that is due date is called the day of your death. And, and when you get to that due date, if you haven't got your life right with Jesus Christ. You can, you can, you can do like Brother Frank talked about this morning. You can say, Lord, it's not my fault. It's mom and daddy's fault. Lord, it's not my fault. It, it, it's, it's the neighborhood that I was raised in. It's the school I went to. You can try to blame it on everybody you want to. Depart from me, I never knew it. The preacher shared with us that there are benefits to giving your life to Christ. Then he mentioned this is an open enrollment time. Now is your opportunity to take advantage of accepting Jesus Christ into your heart right now. And while the musicians are playing, if you feel the tug of the Holy Spirit pulling at your heart, don't reject it. Don't fight it. Come. Give your life to Jesus Christ. Confess your sins to Him. Invite Him into your heart your Savior Lord and you become on the, on, on the winning side. Don't let this opportunity pass you by because none of us know when that due date called death is going to come. And when it comes opportunity to go back, reset it, to give you another chance. Let us pray. Most gracious Father in heaven, how we do thank you and praise you for this word of assurance that you've given us today. That no matter how bad things are going on around us, no, no matter what difficulties, pain, sorrow, that we're having to deal with. We're still on the winning side because we're still in Jesus Christ. So Father, encourage our hearts and give us that hope that we will never ever be separated from your love. 
that because they have sinned, they are no good to you anymore. And they have turned away and walked away from the faith. But Father, I pray right now that your Holy Spirit will search out that chronicle wherever they find it. Put your loving arms around them and tell them that you still love them and that they're still on the winning side and they can come back. And then finally, Father, I pray for that one who cannot claim any of these benefits because they have never, ever given their heart and life to Jesus Christ. I pray, Father, that your spirit will draw them to the feet of Jesus, open their heart and give them the faith to make Jesus Christ their Savior and Lord this very day so that they can have the benefit of being on the winning side. This is your servant prayer we pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank God. And amen. Like again, we want to thank this young man for that great, powerful amen. message. That no matter what happens, I'm on the winning side. Right. Because you know that you know that the, the other day. I was watching a baseball game, and my team was leading. Then they let these other guys come back and tie it up. Then they went into extra innings, and they let these guys get ahead of them. And I said, oh, man, they done gave up this game. But, but when that time came up, a player hit a three-running home run, and my team won. But you see, this brother reminded us that no matter how the game of life may look to you, you're on the winning side. You know that when the game of life is over with, you still win. So I just thank God for him, and he always blesses me. He always does a good job, and, 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 uh, and, I, and I know, I don't have to ask, I know that you've been blessed. And before we chairman comes up, I, I just want to again take this opportunity to thank all of you who faithfully continue to support the church with your tithes and offerings. Many of you make the sacrifice and you drive all the way over here to drop it off. Some of you drop it in the mail. Some of you have us come by and pick it up. And then there are those of you who who do it through electronic giving. But however, you have faithfully, continuously, even in the midst of a pandemic, continuously supported us with your tithes and offerings. And I just want to tell you thank you. And if you allow me this moment, and at the conclusion of this prayer, the chairman is going to come and have words. And then, then the, uh, when the chairman is, is, is finished, our speaker is going to come back and give us our closing remarks and benedictions. But would you allow me at this time to just thank God for your giving and praise for us upon you? Would you bow with me just briefly? Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for these gifts that was given. And we thank you for those that gave the gifts. We pray, Lord, that you will bless them for their faithfulness and giving. And we pray, Lord, that you will bless these tithes and offerings. Use them for the purpose for which they were given, the ongoing work of your kingdom here on this earth through this local assembly. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Good morning again, church family. It is still morning. And listen, we want to thank God for uh, being here to God be the glory. Amen. For the things that he has done. I thank Reverend Dove for opening up this morning. Reverend Robson bless you with that timely message. Uh, he went down a list in that message and naming some ways you can feel. Uh, but he encouraged us today that we're on the winning team. And I, I thank you for that because I was in some of those categories that he was naming. Uh, All right. So I, I thank you for that word of encouragement this morning. Uh, um, I've been told and I am aware. Uh, that we are growing weary uh, during this time uh, of our 
pastoral vacancy. I, I know that, I understand that. Uh, during this pastoral search, uh, and as Deacon Phillips said this morning, I take responsibility for that. I'll take responsibility for that. We're continuously praying. We're continuous, continuously fasting uh, in this situation, getting counsel from other churches and other ministers uh, right. who are uh, working, uh, I'll say, with me um, as we go through this uh, time. I'm reminded of, 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 of Moses when he went to the mountaintop to talk to God. And down in the valley, the people were doing things of their own. Uh -huh. And they had gotten away from God. And I want us to know, don't get away from God. We're on the winning team. Yeah. Don't get away from God. Don't get away from the church. Listen, we're on the winning team. Uh, the preacher said on last week, uh, uh, God will turn around. Yeah. Oh, yeah. God will turn around. Oh, so, yeah. So be encouraged. Uh, don't, don't give up. We are moving uh, fast. It seems slow, but we're moving fast. Okay, thanks to all that make this possible, the media, the ministers, the musicians, the messenger teachers, and yes, you the membership. We couldn't do this without you, and we're so grateful for what you do. Uh, Sunday school books are in. Please, please come down and pick up your Sunday school books. Our teachers, you can meet in the classroom. The superintendent has those books ready. Uh, can't see him, call him or call the church, call Reverend Jackson, uh, Sister Superintendent. They'll have those books ready for you if you need us to deliver them. Please let us know. We want everybody to enroll and be in part of Sunday school, okay? Yeah, uh, men, all men, we're calling all men. I need all men that can and will meet me here at the church next Saturday, or this coming Saturday, shall I say, at 10 a.m., 10 a.m. And listen, if you cannot make the meeting, Please give me a call. Please give me a call. Call the church and say you can't make it. Uh, some important news I need to share with you. Some important information I need to get from you as we go forward. So pass the word on. I need to talk with all men at least by next Saturday. Um, important meeting coming up. All right. Um, and again, as Reverend Jackson stated, thanks to all those who are continually supporting the church through prayer and yes, through your tithes and offerings. Uh, we need it. God will bless you as you are, uh, follow his word in your giving and in your support. Amen. Uh, deacons, trustees, I need to talk with you this week. Uh, Sister Kwanzaa had it on fire here, but all of it wasn't the spirit. Uh, it was hot in here this morning. <laughs> so, so, so we need to talk this week yeah. and get some things taken care of. God bless you and God keep you. I love you. Uh, Nothing you can do about it. <laughs> Let everyone say amen. amen. Uh, I have forgot to uh, mention that, uh, uh, you know, I, I still have a close relationship with uh, the guys I played high, high school basketball with and the guys I played basketball with in college. And uh, one of the things that I shared with them, when I was at Seagullville High School, that was our first time going to the playoffs in 14 years. Then when I got a scholarship to Tyler Junior College, it went to Stephen of Austin. But when I was at Tyler Junior College, we was ranked number one in the nation. And, and as I meditated on that, I was sharing with my former teammates, I said, you know what? Uh, we were winning, but we really weren't winners. We became winners when we accepted Jesus as our savior. Because now we're on the winning side. Uh, I pray and hope that something was said uh, that's going to bless your heart throughout this week. And uh, let's remember to, uh, let's continue to uh, pray for the church. Uh, let's be safe because the pandemic is still live and active and people are still dying every day. Uh, but let's continuously to stick together and pray for each other. May we all stand.
Now and forever, and may all of God's people stand together now. Oh.